Uh, if you didn't see that on the, uh, on the screen, 374 people were impacted and fed because of your willingness to be here, your willingness to pray, your willingness to support and be a part of it. So I just wanna say thank you. Uh, Mana Cafe was blown away by what we were able to do. Uh, oh, I didn't even get to, there were probably about 100 to 120 people that we had a prayer team that they were able to pray with people here in our sanctuary and not just meet their physical needs downstairs but meet their spiritual needs up here. Come on, that's something to get excited about. So we're, we're gonna jump into the message. Two more quick announcements. It is 11.03. I'm gonna be tight on time today. Just two quick announcements. Um, I love the fact that we have people that are so generous to make sure that we can worship uh, online uh, through Facebook Live. We're working to actually get YouTube up and running so that you can watch the message portion on YouTube. Here's what I wanna let you know. If you feel like you're sick or you feel like uh, you're coming down with something, you feel like uh, the sniffles, if, whether it's the summer bug or whether it's flu, whatever it is, here's the good news. You can worship with us online. And that doesn't mean that you don't have faith. That doesn't mean you're not standing in faith. That just means we're using wisdom. Because what we also don't wanna do is inspire fear in others if they hear us cough, sneeze, sniffle, uh, and go on about that. So it's okay for us to worship online. There, I know of, I, I already know of 10 people online that just text me, hey, uh, we'll worship with you there. And it's okay. You can still give online. You can still worship and sing online. You can actually dance in your living room and no one will be around there to watch you uh, dance before the Lord. If that's what you wanna do, that's totally fine. So just wanna make that announcement. The second thing is I'm gonna ask you to do this. You, most people don't know that the weight that's on my shoulders uh, when I come up, uh, I'm actually, I usually get to bed on Saturday night around one or two in the morning because I'm prepping all day Saturday. And I'm over here at the building by 6 a.m. And so this is just a little bit of house cleaning and housekeeping in the moment. Here's what I'm gonna ask you to do because I'm in my mind juggling seven to eight things while I preach and getting ready to preach. I'm gonna let you know that I am willing to accept any and all constructive criticism that you may have Monday through Friday between the office hours of nine and five. I would love to meet with each and every, if there's something you have a concern about, you have a question about, I would love to speak with you. What I'm gonna ask us not to do is I'm gonna ask us not to come up to me on Sunday morning before church starts. Because what you don't know is it throws everything I'm trying to keep balanced so that I can hear from the Holy Spirit to give you the message that God wants to convey. It just throws everything out of rhythm. And so I'm gonna ask, not just for the benefit of me, but for the benefit of everyone else in the room, that if you wanna talk with me about something, I would love to hear your heart. I would love to understand your point of view. But I'm gonna ask you to do that Monday through, Friday, Monday through Thursday between nine and five. Is that okay? Is that okay, everyone? All right. That got more applause than the video, man. <laughs> hey, so we are in our series, People in the Bible That You Might Not Know. I'm excited about this series. Uh, we are talking about a character that I think you may know a little bit about, but I, I wanna come at it from a different angle today in his life. And uh, remember, we're in this series because uh, the, the word of God, if anyone has the gift of gab, it's God. And if he said it, there's reason for it in here. And so we want to maybe understand it and look at it for what he's trying to get to us. And in the story of a man that's lame, it's because he wants us to see that he can show up in our lives and give us the availability to run freely after him. In the story of a person that's born blind, it's because he wants to show up in our lives and recognize and have the scales removed from our eyes so that we can see what it is that he's doing in our lives. Come on. The Bible, it's, full. it's not just these great people of faith. It's these great people that just had an extraordinary yes to whatever it is that he told them. So it was, it was uh, blue-collar workers. It was single moms. It was people battling internal battles and demons on the inside of them. They're people just like you and I that just, that just had an encounter with Jesus and said yes. And so maybe there's reason for even the weird things in here that we don't understand. Maybe there's reason for it. Let me, we're talking about a guy this week, his name is Naaman. 
Uh, he's in, in the Old Testament in 2 Kings, but l- let me set it up this way. I-, I went and had dinner with one of our church families this week. It was really cool. We sat down, we had dinner, and they just started fielding me questions all about just, we started in the book of Revelation, and we made our way backwards, and we found ourselves all the way in Genesis, and then bounced off that wall and came back to the cross and the purpose of, 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 the, of the cross in our lives. And And their son got up halfway through because he had to go take care of some things. And I'm still talking with with, uh, the mom and the dad. And we're just going through. And lo and behold, I hear this noise out in the distance. And I thought it was a wild animal. I'm, I'm like, I'm reaching for my gun. Like, I'm just, there's something out here is immediately trying to eat us. And I'm gonna have to go into the shepherd mode and protect the flock in this moment, right? And so they see me just kinda like, look a little weird and they said no no that's just that's just our son he's out calling in the cows it's like oh well that was a very strange noise to call in the cows it sounded like some some wild beast from the amazon and it was just it was interesting like i'm look i i was the house on the road that didn't have a farm my neighbors had farms like there was pigs right down the road there were goats right down the road like the smell of manure reminds me of home it, but it's just like I never knew that you could call in animals and just have this distinct sound. It was foreign to me. What I heard sounded distorted. But to those animals, it called them in, and it was, it was a language that they understood. I think we're going to find similarity in Naaman's life today when we look at the story of Naaman. We're gonna read 14 uh, verses of scripture. It's in 2 Kings chapter 5, verse one through 14. There's more to this story, but I just wanna hone in on these. Let's, uh, let's read it together, will we? Uh, it says, Naaman, in verse one, the commander of the army of the, king of, uh, of the king of Syria was a great man with his master and in high favor because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but... He was a leper. Turn to someone and say he was a leper. That was terrible. That was terrible. All right, you got, turn to someone else that you did not tell and say he was a leper. There you go. All right. He was a leper. Now the Syrians on one of the raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, would that my Lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, or the king, thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he, Naaman, went, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, when this letter reaches you, know that I've sent Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. Verse eight says, but Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes. He sent to the king saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him, Naaman, come now to me that he, Naaman, may know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse nine, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent the messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, behold, I thought that he would come out surely to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place to cure the leper. Uh, Are not Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. But his servants came near to him and said, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, he actually said to you, wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. Let me, let me kind of give you Nathan's interpreted version. Naaman's a successful guy. 
He's, he's got trophies and he's got things that have been lauded on him and, and he's got everything externally going right for him. People know him. He's a man of influence. He's a man of power. Uh, he has opportunities that are ahead of him just because of who he is. The problem is, is he has a disease that's killing him from the inside out. It didn't matter how successful he was. It didn't matter how much money he had. It didn't matter how affluent he seemed. It didn't matter that he had a new vehicle and a big house. There was something going on on the inside of him that was eating away at him. He had leprosy. Leprosy, it's, uh, it's the symptoms that start in the skin and the peripheral, I think I said that right, nervous system. I'm, I'm not, I, I know enough to Google, right? My sister, she's the nurse. She's good at this stuff, right? We've got other nurses and people like that. If I'm wrong, just send me an email. Uh, it's the symptoms start in the skin and the peripheral nervous system outside the brain and the spinal cord, then spread, help me out, spread, I'll read it here, then spread, <laughs> oh, then spread, period. That's my bad. That's a grammatical error. <laughs> that one's on me, Emily. That one's... Can we give it up for Emily and Levi and the folks in the booth? That one's my fault. Here's what happens is, is it attacks the nervous system. It actually numbs the nerves. And so what happens, these things called lymphoras, I believe, uh, lepromas, they form on the skin and in the respiratory tract like tumors. It, it numbs the nervous system, and so what happens is more often than not, people, uh, they gain deformities, not simply because of the leprosy, but because they injure themselves and don't know it. Like they pick up something hot or boiling or something that's on fire, and they can't feel it, so it deforms their hand in the moment. Their senses are off. This is what Naaman has. The, the, the poorest person in his, in his city, even though he's one of the most affluent, wouldn't trade him skin for skin. Like, hey, I may be poor, but I ain't got what you got. I may be poor, but I'm not dealing what, with what you're dealing with. I may not have it all together on the outside, but, but I'm not having to battle what you're having to battle. Naaman is literally dying from the inside out. So here's what he does. He hears about a prophet in Israel. So he goes to the prophet, right? The, per, the prophet, the person in the Old Testament responsible for hearing the word of God and delivering it. The word, like the, the word. If the prophet said it, then that was bound to happen. It was like, like if the prophet misspoke and said, thus saith the Lord, and it didn't come to pass, that joker got stoned. He got taken outside the city and beaten with rocks until he died. That's like, so when he spoke, it was a sure thing. So Naaman hears about this guy. The prophet Elisha gives him the word of the Lord. Go wash in the Jordan River seven times. But he hears about what's going on. But he has something that on the inside of him that even though he hears, it distorts what he hears. He, hear me out. He's got two things out of this story that I think we can see. Two things that keep Naaman from operating in faith. But I think, just hear me out, I think they're the two same things that keep you and I from operating in faith. I, I think he's got, we can look in this story and see that there are two specific things that keep him from, from listening to what the man of God said, listening to what the prophet said. Here, here's, what, here's where we need to go. The first thing, it, it's, it's conjecture. I can't, it doesn't say it, but we can contextualize it and we can understand that the first thing he's dealing with is fear. The first thing Naaman is doing, he's dealing with fear. H how do I know that? I mean, what if that was you? What if you're the person in Naaman's situation? Just hang on, we're going somewhere. Naaman is battling fear in this moment. How do I know that? 
How do I know? Because let's just, let's just put some context behind it. It's enough of an issue in Naaman's life that some servant girl in his house hears about it and it's a big enough deal that the servant girl goes and tells not Naaman, but Naaman's wife about it. It, it, it. Fear, it's a big enough deal in Naaman's life that he would go petition his boss, the king, to get a letter so that he can go to Israel and seek out this prophet. It's a big enough deal that he goes and he gets a payment for the prophet in, in 10, uh, what, what was it, 10, uh, what is it, 10, 10, uh, 10 talents of silver. A hun- in our day, $165,000 worth of silver. 6,000 shekels of gold. In our day, $3.9 million in gold. He, sa- he brings with him a, hu- a check for $165,000. A bank note, a bank check for $3.9 million and a, a Target gift card for some clothes. Can we, can we just use the NIV, Nathan's interpreted version this morning? Right? It's a big enough deal to him to bring all of this to the prophet. But here's what happens. Hear, hear me out. The, the things that similarly keep us operating in faith, these two things, one of them being, one of them being fear. Uh, 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 watch it. He hears from the prophet. He hears what the prophet says. But something inside him distorts what he hears. It distorts what he hears and it distorts how he responds. Hear me, I'm being serious. I'm not trying to make a joke out of this. He hears what the prophet says, but it's so out of kilter because of the fear on the inside of him that it doesn't make sense to him. Think about that. The prophet tells him something very easy to do. Go go dip in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be clean. And Naaman, because of the fear on the inside of him. What is fear? Fear is simply, it is, it is, it's, it's, uh, what is, it's, it's the belief that someone or something is dangerous, likely to cause pain or threat. It's more real to him than the faith he's encountering. Think about that. That's the filter through which, hear me, watch me, watch me. That's the filter through which he's perceiving faith, even though the the man of God is dead serious, even though the man of God is giving him an an act of faith to operate in, Naaman can't even hear it because it's distorted. That's what that's what fear will do every time. It'll distort fear. It it, it will it it will uh, it, it will. Uh, it, it will give misleading or false accounts. It, it, will, it will take your situation, your fear, and no matter what's going on, it will, it will modify so that your situation doesn't even make sense to you. It's all you can sense and gather is the fear through which you're trying to perceive what faith is trying to tell you to do. Think about that. Think about that. Here's what, here's fear. It's a big enough issue that God talks about it. It's a big enough issue. Like, watch, watch this. It, because the devil will use fear to get you to stop your forward progress towards the plan and, and purpose that God has for you. Here, here's what it'll do. Uh, it, it, it will, it, fear is, is the man behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz. Does that make sense? It's the man, like this, the bit, we have to go meet the wizard. But it's a guy behind a curtain that's operating and making your situation. He's distorting your situation so that when faith tries to enter, you can't hear it right. 
This is why God would say in, uh, in, first, in 2 Timothy that God, he's not even giving you. He names it a spirit of fear. What has he given you? Power. He's given you love. And he's given you a sound mind. This is what, Jesus would say this. Jesus calls it out. Peace I leave with you. Second, uh, Luke 14, 27. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Psalms 34, 4 through 5. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. 365 times in your Bible, do you realize 365 times, it says, do not fear. If God is trying to, watch, if faith is trying to convey something daily, maybe it's that right there. Don't be afraid. Don't, why? Because fear distorts the sound of faith. Every time. That's what it does. The second thing, the second thing that we see, it's, it's easier. We, we don't have to look at conjecture. We, we don't have to look at, uh, we don't have to put context uh, uh, behind the situation. We don't have to, it, it's very easy. In verse 12, 11 and 12, is that what it is? Uh, let me see, 11 and 12. At first, Naaman is angry angry but then right he leaves and it turns into it escalates it graduates it elevates it goes from anger to rage because frustration is the entry level where you start getting annoyed and you start getting overwhelmed and you start getting aggravated and it goes from frustration to anger to rage every single time the second the second ingredient why he couldn't hear faith Frustration, watch. The feeling of being annoyed, upset, or especially because of an inability of inability to change or achieve something. This is what Naaman is dealing with. This is what Naaman is, is fighting with. He, watch, he hears faith, yes? He hears faith, but because of fear and because of frustration, he can't perceive it, what's going on. Inside of him, the frustration, it distorts. So when he's trying to hear what faith has to say, it doesn't sound normal. It sounds off. It, he's looking around and trying to figure out what on earth am I going to do? And there's so much frustration on the inside of him that faith doesn't sound normal. It sounds off. It sounds weird. It catches everyone. They're like, I don't know what's going on. This is super awkward right now. That's what frustration does. That's what it does. I'm trying to get this all out of my system. <laughs> That's what frustration does. It distorts what faith should sound like. We get so caught up in the moment that we're frustrated on, we can't hear with clarity what faith is trying to convey so that we will step out and realize that God wants to do something in our lives that's bigger than what we could do on our own because we can't fix our own problems. We can't, we can't handle our own problems. Can you come tie this for me, please? I'm... No, no, take your time. <laughs> this is what frustration does. It, it distorts, it pulls us out of shape. It, it twists it twists the situation, watch. So it, it builds, here's what frustration does. It builds a house that, that holds a fence which breeds into anger, which, which breeds into unforgiveness, which breeds bitterness. That, that's what frustration that's what it does in our life. So when God is trying to convey something, we can't even hear it right. It's distorted. Here's, here's, what, here's what 
for, uh, it's, it, 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 the aftermath of frustration leads to the emotional and affective responses such as stress, lasting anger, sadness, and rage. It's the typical responses include uh, quitting, burning out, and giving up, low self-esteem, low self-confidence, stress, and depression. These are the, this is what grows out of our frustration when in the moment God's trying to speak faith and trying to get us to look at what he has said. We're so locked in on the frustration, we can't even hear him because it's distorted. Here's what God says. Ephesians 4.26, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. James 1.9 uh, 1, 19 through 20, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's what our frustration our frustration, it grows, it breathes amongst itself, and it becomes this thing that, is, that gets us where we aren't in right standing with God so that when we have a situation that we need to hear from him, we can't. That's where it leads us. Come on, Proverbs 19 says, good sense makes one slow to anger. The antithesis of that is someone with no sense is quick to anger. That hit me square between the eyes. I'll be honest, I've got a short fuse. I do. I'm quick to anger. And that hit me square between the eyes like, oh, I didn't like that one, Lord. I didn't like that one. I, meaning I need, to, I need to handle forgiving some people in my life because I'm quick to anger about certain situations. Here, here, here's what Colossians 3 it says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth because frustration always distorts the sound of faith. Fear always distorts the sound of faith. The prophet, however, spoke as God's mouthpiece. He spoke as God's mouthpiece. What did he do? He spoke in faith. He spoke with faith. He spoke in, 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 in things that didn't make sense to Naaman, right? It, he, he said, if you do this, then God will show up. Well, what is, what, what do you, Nathan, what do you mean he's spoken faith? Here's, the, here's the, a layman's description and, and definition of faith. Faith is simply knowing God. You can tweet that if you want. Put it on your MySpace, your TikTok, whatever it is that you have. Faith is simply knowing God. The more I know him, the more I have faith that he'll do what he said he'll do. You had faith to sit in that pew. Why? Because you had an ongoing understanding that it held you previously. Because you had an ongoing understanding that it held you previously. The more I get in his word, the more I get ongoing understandings of how he operates and how he functions. So I don't, hear me, I don't mind sitting and resting in his presence, even though fear and frustration are trying to get in my heart and get in my mind. I'm sitting and I'm leaning in faith. That's what, that, that's why I'm, I'm not here to be a confession cop and say, no, don't say you're sick. I've got friends that are confession cops. Don't say, don't say anything like that. Like, it's, it's annoying. I'll be honest with you. Can I be transparent? It's annoying. I need to know the facts of my situation, but I also need to know the truth of my situation. This is the truth. This, when I stand on this, this is the difference maker in my life. I don't, I don't have to figure my situation out. I have to figure out what he said about my situation. You have a prayer request. Text me, yes. But text me alongside the scripture that you're standing on so that I can pray in agreement with you. I've got sickness in my family. Awesome, Isaiah says that by his stripes they're healed. Let's, let's come into agreement on that scripture.
because that's what it means to partner with his word. In that moment, it doesn't matter how much fear, how much frustration there, because we're standing in faith. Come on, here, here's, what, here's what God says about faith, that my, my confession, my confession of this, of, when I start to use the word as my word, it makes order come into the chaos of my life. Does that, does that make sense? When, when, when I mirror what this says about my situation that is chaotic, that is running buck wild, that is just blowing up in front of me, the word commands order to chaos. Prove it, Nathan. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded, hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And out of chaos came order. And light has never stopped. Why? Because he never told it to. That, he, he had an understanding of who he was so that when he spoke, he was actually speaking faith. That's faith. He, here's, what, here's what faith, faith uh, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Here's what God is saying. I don't need you to tiptoe around your situation gauged by how you are sensing it. I don't need you to operate and navigate your situation based on how it makes you feel. If you really want to get down to the bare bones, brass tacks of it, God, hear me, hear me with spiritual ears. God is not interested in how you feel. It's not about your feelings because your feelings will lie to you. You ever wake up and you just like, you just woke up in a bad mood? Why? What happened? Does that make sense? Your feelings will lie to you nonstop. We walk by faith, not by how we feel. Here's, here's what, here, it gets misquoted all the time, but uh, it gets misquoted all the time. Romans 4, 17, calling those things that be not as though they were. This is actually God in Abram's life, Abraham's life, speaking to the purpose in Abraham right here. Let's read it. As it is written, God said, I have made you, Abraham, the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, Abraham believed, who gives life to the dead and who God calls into existence the things that do not exist. What does that mean? That means if it doesn't exist in your life, but God said it in here, he's calling it into being. If you have sickness in your life and you see in here that he said by your stripes you are healed, he is calling into existence things that aren't as though they were. That's faith. He's out of nothing. He's manufacturing something for you. That's that's how, so in that moment, yeah, we can speak to a mountain and, be, and cast it into the sea. We can speak to dead things and command them to come to life. We can speak to cancer and command them to go. We, why? Because I can find it in here, then he will do it in here. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that making it simple for faith? It's not some like ethereal feeling. It's just knowing God. And because if you can see where he showed up in someone else's life, if he showed up in your life, it's an indicator of his character, so then he'll do it for me because he's no respecter of persons. It's not that I have great faith. I'm just seeing what he did in someone else's life. And if he did it for them, he'll do it for me. Let's, Hebrews 11, three. Through faith, we understand, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are not seen, uh, not seen were made of things which do appear. Hear me out. Let me, let me explain this. Let me explain that verse for you right here. The word will work 
if you work it. If you work the word, you stand on the word, you get faith and understanding of his word, then fear, you start to displace the fear. Why? The helium that was in my lungs ended up getting displaced by oxygen, so I started to sound normal. Does that make sense? If I offended you because I inhaled helium and whatever else was in the balloon, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me, and now let's move past it. The fact is, when faith, you start to fill yourself with faith, it displaces fear. It displaces worry. It displaces doubt. It displaces frustration. It displaces it all. Does that make sense to you this morning? Come on, let's be a people of faith. Let's be a people that know our God and know what he said and know that he wants to do in our lives exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think.